we do, we do those uh, quite a bit. Uh, and I'll illustrate what it is by showing, what, showing some of my own studies. And we get an idea of what it is and what you can do with it. What you cannot do with it. Okay, let's start with topic one. Sweden. This is a map of Europe. So, uh, I, don't know. I don't know if you know, but this country here is Sweden. City where I'm from is the Scots of Europe. The, the, the top of Denmark. Same altitude as the top of the UK and top of Scotland. Um, if you know Amsterdam better, I do. It's about an hour and 50 minutes by one hour of flight distance. And from Amsterdam to Jakarta, it's about 11 hours. <coughs> so we zoom in a bit. And Gothenburg is the, uh, the earthly city on the coast. Um, so Sweden as a country, I think it has 8 million people. It's not so much if you compare it to Indonesia. <laughs> Most of them are in two cities, Stockholm, the capital, and those were years as the coast city. There's also a river going in, so it's a harbor city. For us it's very nice because our office is at the, at the sea, at the harbor. You can also see it's very green. Uh, it's not a rainforest, but it's a pine forest. So there's lots of Christmas trees growing. It's very nice for walking in. In the summer, it's nice for swimming, actually. I think you'll find a little bit too, but you can swim here. And the only thing is that the summer is a bit short, and the winter is a bit long. And so the winters can be maybe four or five months long, and the temperatures go below zero, and the night can be minus 10, minus 15, minus 15 at night. But if it lasts for months, then we actually get the frozen water and the frozen sea. And we have snow, sometimes two weeks, sometimes three months. So when I, when I left last week, there was a little bit of snow left. But it's now starting to melt. So. And then, uh, the other thing is interesting, so Indonesia is almost at the equator. So you have very little uh, difference in daylight between uh, summer and winter. But in Sweden, there's a big difference in, in uh, daylight summer and winter because it's up north so in the, wi the winter the days are short and, and the sun rises at nine and it starts setting at uh, three four o'clock and but in the summer it's opposite we have very long days and the sun starts at three four o'clock in the morning and it sets only at one o'clock at night so the number of sun hours that we have is the same it's just they're distributed a little equally over the year This is a quarter here. Right? So this is a this is Sweden at the same scale as Indonesia. So it's about the same same size as Sumatra, but you have a bit more more than Sweden. So uh, yeah. get an idea. questions. I much rather answer your questions than tell me what is in my slides. Because I can tell my slides anytime, but you can have only this opportunity for asking questions. So it's much better if you raise your hand and you like to know something or like to ask something. And so we're part of two universities. There's a general university and a technical university and computer science is part of both. And we have five divisions ranging from computer science, which has theory and algorithms, software technology, which has programming languages, networks and systems, computer engineering, and software engineering, so that, that's me. And we have at least 30 nationalities in our, in our staff. And we offer bachelor, master, and PhD in English. So start with the bachelor is a three-year degree, master is a two-year degree, 
the PhD is either four or five years. Things that are in English and software engineering. We're starting to increase the amount of entrepreneurship. So how to create a startup in IT. And, uh, and we're also starting to, um, to design a cost uh, program for data. Here's a, a list of some of the topics that I propose that I, I share the slides and then uh, you, can, you can read this part later. These are the, some of the lecturers in our department, our division, so there's a few food professors and assistant and social professors. We work on many of the topics that form together a traditional um, software development process, right? so we have people working in requirements, people working in software architecture and design, people working in model driven development, so it's We'll talk more about it later, but model driven is the use of models like UML in your project where you can either use it as a documentation of the design or you can use it for code generation. Generate the software out of the model. And no people researching programming. No, maybe solve. Not really. And people working in testing, especially for cyber physical cars. So for, for our, our city, it's interesting to know that there's several big companies there. One of them is Volvo, which is an automotive manufacturer. So they make also cars and also trucks. And the other is Ericsson, and they make the telecommunications networks. So everything that your mobile phone does when the signal goes out of your phone is happening in the Ericsson network. Ericsson makes the the hardware, but also the software. And I think they call themselves one of the top 10 software companies in the world because they employ so many software engineers. I think it works in company as a whole, it's at least 5,000 people working on software. So it's really a huge amount uh, across the world. Uh, and uh, for your information, also automotive has a huge amount of software. It's, uh, it's becoming one of the important factors in both the cost and the development time. So if you look at it, if you buy a modern, the, the newest car that comes out of the factory, it will have 100 CPUs and 10 billion lines of software in the car. I think that's a huge amount. I always worry a little bit because I think the best we can do is, uh, if you study how people make uh, mistakes in, in the software, then it's, uh, so it's an empirical study. We learn it by observation. Is uh, one defect per thousand lines of code. That's the best we can do. We can get the best developers and no, no stress and uh, excellent tools and everything. One defect per thousand lines of code. But the car has 10 million lines of code. There, there worries me a little bit. <laughs> there must be 10,000 faults in the software in the car. It's made, it's, it can be made to be reliable. Uh, it's a mix of hardware and software. Uh, so we have, uh, this is one of our projects that we, we try to build self-driving cars. So Google has also a project in this direction. Uh, this is a one of pen scale, about this size. And it drives around in a special room where we have on the floor a circuit. And we mark a road with, with a white rain. And when, when we got the software working here, we tried to bring it into a real car. And then we got to test it this summer. There will be a safety driver in the car also. <laughs> Just to make sure no, no, no bad accidents uh, happen. But uh, actually we do this also as a student project. So the students in the bachelor, they have one project for us. And they they have to develop the software for these, uh, these miniature driving cars. There's also a competition. So I, I had some talks with some of your professors and they told me you win a lot of competitions and awards. So I think this is actually a great competition if, you, if you're interested. Uh, you can also, of course, come as, come as an exchange student to, uh, to Sweden and work in one of the teams. Uh, we have research in software metrics, which is about the measurement of software. I don't know if the topic has been discussed a little bit. You can measure size of software and how many lines of code. We can try to measure reliability of software, the number of defects. We can try to measure the design complexity, the 
or maybe connections are there between components from one component to the other. Those are types of measurements you can do in software. The measurement will play a, an important role later in the talk because uh, software engineering and, and, and informatica they are a young discipline compared to mathematics and physics and chemistry. And uh, sometimes you look at those bigger brothers. Yeah, well, what makes them a science? They must have measurements. They must have an understanding of what is a, a characteristic of a software. There's a famous quotation by a professor called uh, Lord Kelvin. He says, if you cannot measure it, you cannot control it, and you cannot study it as a science. So the measurement of software is, uh, I think, continues to be important as well. Okay, any questions so far? All clear? Can we continue? Okay, about uh, empirical research. What is it? So what's the objective of today's lecture? It is to explain the notion of empirical research. Uh, and how you can do it in all branches of software engineering. You can study processes, or you can study technologies. I study modern driven software engineering. So I'll explain what it is and why I think it is relevant, and then I'll, in the second half of the, the lecture, I'll, I'll give a number of examples. <coughs> so, what is empirical research? It is research that bases its findings on direct or indirect observations as its test of reality. I've taken some examples from our sisters. This is a story. They look in the sky and they see lights. There must be a star. They, they, they try to deduce what the universe looks like based on these observations. And they're looking further and further. Uh, chemistry. Uh, you put two uh, chemistry things together. If it says boom, it's wonderful. We should find something in computer science to do the same. Actually, the self driving cars are good for it because they bump into a lot of things. It's also wonderful. Um, yeah, so chemistry is by observation, eh? sometimes the color changes or the temperature changes. And this is for physics, uh, Newton saw and Apple falls. Eh? Must be something to do with gravity. So this is about observation. And we can do observation in software engineering also. And the goal of software engineering is, is of course to build theories. Uh, we can have a hypothesis about mm, it must work like this. This is a variable that explains this behavior. So, um, one of the things that we know, for example, is uh, if you have a project that is running and it's a, it's a serious project, and more than 20 people, and it's been running for some time, and it's running late, so it's, it's not meeting its schedule. And one of the classic responses of a manager used to be, okay, then I add more people to the project. But now we know that it actually causes more delay <coughs> because people are not the experts in the project and in the domain. It causes more confusion and delay for the people that are already in the project to explain the structure and how everything works. So adding people to a project that is late only makes it later. That's an empirical observation, right? You cannot prove it by mathematics, you just learn it from studying reality. And that's a very useful theory, right? So sometimes people ask about well, that theoretical research and practical research, but I think good theories are very practical. Yeah? If you have a good theory that explains something, you can use it in practice. So I think there's sometimes a <coughs> distinction between practical and theoretical is the artificial. There you go, there was a small side step. So, uh, the goal is to develop these theories about software engineering, turn it into the science. There are many factors. You can study people. Uh, which people are the best testers, or which people are the best programmers. Uh, can you select it by doing an interview or that you can do an IQ test or something like that? You can study processes. Do projects finish faster or with better quality if they use an agile process compared to a workflow process? Or you can study uh, methods or technology. Uh, in my case, we study model based software engineering. I think I've 
that is what we have. So if you're also for engineering, I think you're, you're, you're a little bit start with your course, so you should know not so much about programming only. Actually, there's lots of stuff before the programming and lots of stuff after the programming as well. You need uh, requirements, architecture, design, building, testing, and maintenance. Right? It's, it's uh, 60 to 80 percent of any project work that will be spent on maintenance of the software. Everyone that comes out of university, they want to start uh, new projects and everything from scratch. But the most likely task for you in the future will be to continue working on an existing software. What makes engineering engineering? Yeah, that you have limitations in time, uh, budget, and, uh, and skills. So, uh, you basically, it means you have limited resources, limited cost, and limited schedule. And then you still need to produce the best possible results. Uh, that's, I think, uh, challenging, but also exciting. So, uh, I already mentioned this a little bit uh, within the realm of the theory of studies. There's different things you can study. You can study people, you can study processes, you can study practices. Okay, like pair programming is a, is a practice in HR. People work together as a programmer. Uh, it's also interesting to know that sometimes in technologies are adopted for which there is no good evidence. Most of the programming languages today are object oriented, but there's very little evidence that they're better than not object oriented programs because there's no offering much scientific studies that have done into this area. We just said that yeah, it's a good idea. So there's, there's actually lots of, lots of possibilities for doing studies in this field. Maybe I'll go a little bit faster than I thought, but uh, yeah, we have more time for questions. So we should start preparing for the questions. Okay, here's examples of uh, empirical studies. One is an experiment. Who knows what is an experiment? One. You know it from chemistry or medicine, maybe? In medicine, there's a fairly traditional type of experiment, right? If you want to know if the new medicine works, then you collect a group of people, subjects or participants, and uh, you split them in two. One group becomes the control group, the other group becomes your treatment group. In the treatment group, you, you give your medicine, and with our settings, it will be, you ask them to work with your method or your tool or your process. And you give the same task to the treatment group and the control group. And then when you collect the data, you need to think up front what is the data that you want to collect. And then you can compare at the end. So did they, did they perform the task equally well? So you can look at the quality. Did they perform the task equally fast? In software engineering, you always have a trade off between quality and speed. You can do something very quickly, but the quality is poor. Or you can do something very good quality, and often it's not so fast. This is a trade-off that doesn't exist in other production fields. Uh, was that clear as an explanation of experiment? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions about experiments? There's, there's lots of variations that you can do, of course. So that's a, this is, a start, this is the first lecture about it, and I'll give you a pointer to a book if you're interested in that, uh, in that field. Uh, then there's a, so when you do experiments, experiments you do mostly when you already have the idea of the treatment. When you know that this method is going to be the solution to a problem. Sometimes you have to know, but sometimes you need to find out what is really the problem. And for those for answering those questions, it's better to do a case study or a field study. So in a case study, you go into a company or into a project, and you do observations, sometimes through interviews, and you try to find out uh, what is your problem. I mean, good research starts with asking a good question. So we need to first find out what is a good research question. 
And actually, one way to do it is to ask companies which problems is difficult for you. And then you want to make sure that it's an actual resource problem and not a practical problem. Many companies also have lots of practical problems around. Right? They should solve those in the industry. For, for the very difficult problems, they can come to a universe. Uh, another way to compare experiments and uh, case studies of food services by uh, experiments you can also use to find out the, the, magnitude or the, the magnitude or the size of the effect. If I ask people to work in pairs, are they twice as fast or three times as fast or 1.5 times as fast? So, uh, so it's a magnitude effect that you could also study with experiments. And then a survey is different. I think, I think you must know what a survey is. I think surveys are used so much nowadays, you almost can't visit a single website without being asked to participate in a survey. Right? Like, are you happy with our service? That's a survey, it's a very short one. And you can do that for software engineering. Also, you can ask which techniques are used, or which, which processes are used, and what is the problem to get us. To get a picture of the field, so um, I don't have to surface it to uh, uh, what's the adoption of model driven software engineering companies. I know surveys from the Netherlands, I know one from the team. Maybe you can do one for Indonesia, it would be nice, or some other company. I understand there is some, some industry in Indonesia, also the, the modern area. Uh, yeah, so those are uh, empirical studies. Questions? Empirical studies in software engineering is something like you want to find some theories in software engineering, right? Uh, but maybe sometimes we cannot prove it mathematically. Like you said, that any people to online project would, would just make it better. So uh, I think uh, is I think that the theory that, that is proven now might be not proven for the future. So for example, in in the past, like maybe in the in the eighties and nineties, where the computing power is not as great as today, the software engineering practice is is different from from the past. And like the recent years, when GPU programming is becoming cheaper, then the, the software development might might change too. So how do you address this problem? Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, if we if we look at uh, physics and chemistry, like something is actually accepted as a theory if it is independent in time. So the rules of physics and chemistry they hold yesterday, they hold today, and they hold tomorrow, we think. It's in the, the science of science. What is science actually says we can, also, we can only falsify things. So which is not true. It leaves us with us, but that must be the case. So for software engineering, I agree with you in the sense that uh, the developments are growing very rapid uh, in compute power and in, in, in programming environments and languages. But uh, I, would, I would prefer that the, themes, that the theories that we develop are independent of the technology. Uh, so maybe you can use it as a test to say, okay, is the study that I'm designing, is it going to give me an insight that is independent of time? or specific of this technology or time. I mean, as a scientist, you want to generalize, right? You want your theories to hold as broadly as possible. So, uh, sometimes you need to study something that is relevant right now, but hopefully it will still be valid in the future. So there are studies that say, uh, compare a number of defects between C++ and Java. Right? So we know that we make more mistakes in C++, and of course, that is technology of now, but we can also understand why this happens. And probably it's because
because of some of the constructs in C++ something like that. I think pointers are horrible in C++. And so you can analyze why many mistakes are made. So you have an explanation which is more independent of the specific point in time. So I would generalize by saying programming languages with pointers are more likely to have many mistakes than programming languages without pointers. So then you lift it from the instance level, C++ and Java, to a more general level. Does that answer your question? So, so is uh, is the theory that that was not relevant? Is the most relevant theory in the theory of software engineering studies? Sorry, please. Is, is the theory that was relevant in the times like yeah like like what you just said? Maybe it was relevant to today, but not relevant tomorrow. Is considered is uh, still considered a theory? Yes, that's currently still a theory. So we don't know. We, we hope that our theory is will still be relevant. But we don't know. It's, a, it's a bit like that we expect the sun to rise tomorrow. It has done for so many years. We expect the rise of tomorrow. But it's uh, essentially science is uh, based on likelihood. Other questions? I'm going to make a start with the. Uh, Getting started with the empirical research. And my first uh, uh, slide is about the book, which is a guide, a guide to advanced empirical software engineering research. I'll share with you the slides. So you don't, uh, and you didn't get it from me, but if you search on the internet, you can find it. Yeah, so you don't need to pay it for it. And this actually is a survey about, uh, about all different types of empirical studies that you can do, ranging from field studies and actually I did mention focus groups. And you, need to, you need to know a bit about statistics. And there's guidelines on how to build theories and how to do the reporting. And the reporting is actually important. Uh, and often it's, not, it's actually it's difficult, I don't know. But it's important because uh, the value of science depends on the dissemination of science, right? If it's one person that knows it and no one else knows it, it's still not valuable science. So the way that we write it down and then we disseminate it is actually a very important part. That is actually one of the key key purposes of universities also, right? They're, they're a collector of knowledge and a disseminator of knowledge, which is why universities are very important. Okay, the next book is specifically about uh, experimentation. So it's one typical type of uh, empirical study, experimentation, but it's, it's an important one and a very popular one. Uh, as I said, you can have experimentation in many fields, in medicine, chemistry, physics, psychology. You can use experimentation, so you can also find books that are in general about experimentation. But this one is specific for uh, software engineering. Which you mentioned one other type of uh, of empirical study, which is a systematic literature review. And nowadays, there's a, so what do you do in a systematic literature review? You define a particular topic area. So I say, uh, search-based testing. It must, it must be a bit narrow, too broad, otherwise you get too many papers. Then you enter this into a search system. I have the access to IEEE uh, libraries or to the, yeah. So you enter it in the IEEE library search, and then it gives you a set of papers, and you try to make uh, a synthesis of okay, what's the findings of all the papers in this domain. It's become a popular type of uh, publication also. All right. Um, then there's a book on, on measurement in software engineering called the Software Metrics. And uh, I think this the picture is the second edition, there's a fairly condition that exists. And uh, this explains how to measure various type of things in software engineering. Uh, I mentioned there is different things that you can measure. You can measure processes based on effort. You can measure on your product, like the size, 
and you can measure things like experience or skill. Uh, but some things have remained very difficult to measure, for instance, productivity. Uh, measuring productivity of software project turns out to be very hard. And uh, there's, you, you cannot find an answer in the current scientific literature on how to do this. So uh, that's an interesting scientific question that is open. Maybe the answer is you cannot measure it. Okay, so now uh, you, can, you can do more reading at home if you want. Uh, let me explain a little bit about my own research interests. But can I, can I assume that most of you are, have seen at some point the class diagram? Can I? Yeah? Can you raise your hand if you've seen the class diagram? What do you think? Uh, I think this is too, too few hands. Right? I think there's a bit. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever seen the class diagram. Yeah, much better. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the class diagram is actually an example of a UML diagram, right? It is a, a specific notation that is meant for software engineering. It is a standard. So whenever we design software, we use UML diagrams like class diagrams to document the design of the system. So I also wanted to know if you were awake. So, uh, uh, but there exist other type of diagrams also, like sequence diagrams and activity diagrams. And uh, in the field of, uh, I say, when, when I was studying, I learned about the waterfall process. I don't know if you've learned about waterfall process. But because nowadays Agile is much more popular. But there's little evidence that it's better, by the way. But the Agile is more popular. So waterfall was you do a phase, which is actually a waterfall activity and a phase fall together. And in Agile, it's actually the activities are split across many iterations and you do it with. So you first make a requirements document and you ask someone to step it, and go to the design department, and when they decide to step it, and it goes to the next. And, and yeah, people were realizing uh, we're making this design and then the implementation goes off in a completely different direction. So why are we doing this design? In Agile that is, um, I would say, less the case because I think it's important to have short iterations. Um, but then the question still remains. I know there's this Agile manifesto which says that uh, any software project should prioritize working software over documentation. And in practice it means that they never make any documentation and they just do coding. <laughs> so that, that's not what that meant, but this is what happens. And uh, actually we did a survey in the of study in uh, Agile projects to ask them whether they were satisfied with their documentation. The majority of the projects said they were not satisfied with the documentation. But they preferred that their project would make a better documentation. So the, the guidelines that exist on agile documentation, they're not good enough. That's a finding from an empirical survey. But the question remains is uh, how much should I document? Because if you document every detail, it will be a lot of work, especially if your project grows very large. So um, the, other, the other factor that plays a role that at the point that you make a design, you, do, you don't know all your design decisions yet. And sometimes you need to first make some design decisions, maybe implement a bit, find out what works and what doesn't work before you continue your design. So, um, and that requires that you have documentation that you can easily update. Yeah. Again, the, the tools are very poor at supporting this at this moment. Because what happens most of the time, people make a drawing on a whiteboard and take a picture. Picture the work document, and then they think they have documentation. But no one can update this documentation, right? So the next best thing is PowerPoint, which is okay, but it's, it's important that you update it. I said before, 60 to 80 percent of the project is maintenance. What does it mean? Updating your code, but also updating your design. And design is not a static thing; it will evolve over time as well. So. Uh, 
So my, biggest, my, my, my interest was, okay, how much time do we need to spend on this design activity, this modeling? So when I, when I spent more time about thinking and studying this question, I also started distinguishing modeling and designing. So to me, designing is making the design decisions. I will have a three-tier system. I will use Java as a programming language. Maybe I will have a web user interface. And modeling is about representing your design decisions in a particular location, in a particular language, expressing it in your way. And of course, it's the case that when you make a model, you need to make design decisions. So you can't, you can't always separate the two. But uh, yeah, I wanted to know um, if there's a payoff. If I invest time in creating a design and a model early in the project, Will it lead to better code or a better quality design? So, uh, so to understand the, the context a bit of this model during the software film, I want to explain there is a spectrum, so a range of, of flavors. Uh, there is a, a fair number of projects that do code only. Uh, what's a model? I don't know, they're not interested. Then this can work, but I would say it works only for small projects. Then there's projects that use models for visualization and maybe after the facts, where they create software by programming, and at some point they want to find out what they've built and they, they make a picture of it, but they make the code first and the picture later. Then there's round trip engineering, where you start with a model and you produce code based on it, but still often manually. Uh, can be automated sometimes, but sometimes when you change the code, you also can do that again. Sometimes it's automated, but sometimes it's manual. And then there's model centric, where you say the model is the code. This is actually becoming popular in the, in the field of embedded software, like automotive, where they make models only, and they generate all of the implementation out of the code with code generators. And uh, another <coughs> branch, I would say, more, very more centric is that there's not even code generated, but the model is interpreted. So you, you specify a data model, you specify a flow using a collaboration or activity diagram, you specify screens using a graphical editor, you don't need to generate code, you can, you can interpret it. So it's, that has become a bit of a graphical programming language in the world. So when I studied uh, model driven development, uh, I'm, I'm mostly in the middle. I'm in, I'm in the stage where there's a project of between five and a hundred people, and they sit together at the start of the project, and they, they have an idea of what are the requirements, and then they start, they start sketching a solution. Off, they start at the whiteboard, say, so this component here, and the component there, and this is how it connects to them. And then they, I assume that they then, the next step is they go to the computer, they go to a case tool, they will know what we do. I don't know if you use any particular one. Rational rows or visual paradigm. Some of them you know what we do. Plot you know. So uh, I started with doing some uh, exploratory studies. I'd say it's a survey or a field study. Because I wanted to know what, uh, what happened. I wanted to know what the industry was doing. And I, wanted, I wanted it to support, to help me in formulate a research question. And to understand the state of the practice. What is, what is happening in the industry? So this survey I did while I was while actually I was still working in the Netherlands. Um, this mentions uh, 14 projects, and it uh, states the number of classes in their uh, in their human design, the number of person years spent on building, the number of team members at C event level. I don't know if you still discuss that. It's supposed to, it's supposed to be an indicator for the maturity or the level of professional. Of the software development. So it's in, in India, they made a point of certifying the CMF level 5. It's 
supposedly the best you can do. So everything becomes uh, predictable and repeatable and uh, very professional. But you can see most of the project that we found were actually level one, which is beginner, and level two, three. This was actually in the medical domain. They were building medical systems for X-ray, I think. So, um, okay, so this, this, this gave me a, a global idea about uh, the size. I also asked them which type of diagrams they used. So it's not adding scientific value very much in the sense that I can say that some technique works or not. But I, at least I know what, what happens and what is the state of practice. So it told me that they use class diagrams a lot, that they use use case diagrams and sequence diagrams the most. There's a few other diagrams but they're not used as much. And for those of you that are quick into the mathematics, one of the questions that you can start answering is uh, or analyzing is that is there a relation between the person years and the size? You know, if there's a larger person years, must be a large project. Maybe they need a large design. So you can do that correlation. It's a statistical technique for comparing the averages or finding if there's a pattern between the two data sets. And it turns out there is no relation between the size and the, the number of persons and the number of classes of the size. And that by itself is kind of interesting. So for any other production, you would think if I spend more time, I build something bigger. But it doesn't show here for something. So that's, that's a good starting point for asking questions. Right? What's going on there? If there is no such a relation, well, we expect it. And um, we found an answer. But I propose that I show it and explain it after the break. So you have some time to think about it. I'm also willing to answer some questions now. We can use your five minutes for the questions. We can also continue after the break. How long the break shall we have? 15 minutes? Yeah? Uh, let's do a, a 10 minute break then. So we continue five minutes before four o'clock. Okay? See you in ten minutes. <laughs> So we were discussing most others about the possible uh, student projects that you can do for uh, the master thesis project. One of the projects that is a, is a survey is uh, what does the software engineering industry in Indonesia look like? It would be quite interesting to find out which type of companies <coughs> exist. Many companies that use software that we know. We know that banks and insurance and telecom are huge software users. Um, but there's also software in factories, uh, software in games that is being made in the uh, software in apps being made in the future. So uh, there's lots of stuff going around it. And then uh, what makes, the, makes it a bit difficult to find out is if you go into a bank or if you go into a telecom, there's lots of packages that exist, the existing software they can buy and they connect and integrate it rather than build it for you, which is the tailor-made type of software. So, packages is not actually generating a lot of jobs in terms of software engineering. So if you're interested in where are the jobs in, in software, you're more interested in where is the custom-made or tailor-made software engineering. But uh, maybe you need to contact the Ministry of Trade find out uh, typically they have databases of companies that you can query or you can approach with a survey or a field study. So that can be something to try and you can ask what, 
when, which methods and techniques they use. Do they use waterfall or agile? Do they use Java or C++? Do you get an idea? I think you can find examples of such lists if you study the, the literature. Otherwise, uh, your professor can help you with constructive survey questions. Uh, we'll see more questions. So I want to return to the topic of, uh, of model based. And I mentioned before the break that we have this table where we found uh, uh, new models being made. And we have uh, indicators of the size ranging from 734 classes. It's not a small system. Five, 15 main years spent on building it. But the team is only five people. Whereas here you see it's a very small one, one person here, four classes. So there was no correlation that we couldn't find a pattern that, that matched. Then we started to find out. Then we, after the survey, we started asking the next question. I said, it's not always the first question that is really the, the final answer. Maybe you need to iterations of research. Maybe first you do a survey, then a field study, and then a case study or an interview. So the next uh, survey that we did was we asked, um, what is your style of modeling? Because we knew there is this UML standard, it's an international standard. And we asked them, how strictly do you follow the standards? Now there's a few that we don't do it at all. Cowboys, very loose or that thing. Then there's the majority of them that are fairly loose. This is percentages of response. Then there's about 30% that is fairly strict. And 8%, 7% is very strong. So in, in the interviews, we ask more and more about what do they, what do they use the documentation and what is for. <coughs> then we found that in these projects, they use models for understanding and for communication. And to have a group of people agree on something, then you can share it uh, across sites. You have a, a company that has an office in Indonesia and an office in Malaysia and an office in Japan, but you still need to agree on the design, then it is good to codify it, it's good to write it down. Uh, but it doesn't need to be super detailed, right? Not everything to the finest, finest statement needs to be in the documentation. Because, I mean, the source code you can share anyway. So it's very it's important to have a good abstraction then. In this region, between groups and strength, it said everything was mentioned, was mentioned complexity. If you need to create a system, and the system will have 100 classes or 200 classes, it's better to have some kind of plan on what can be connected to each other and what cannot be connected to each other. Because otherwise, the most common bad practice will happen is that everything connects to everything. I didn't include it in my slides, but I, I have a series of slides which shows how a system evolves from the first six months to the next year to the next year. And it grows from five components to 15 components to 100 components. And the interconnections stay very little first, but they're all over the place in the third slide. They're not in the there was not a clear plan. So the, the design helps you identify the structure, the architecture of your, of your system. The architecture can help you decide on which dependencies are allowed, how to structure in terms of layering. Okay, we have one layer here, we have business logic, we have layer presentation logic. So then just writing it down helps you to clarify the structure that you want in your system. And the, the fourth category of, of purpose and use was the, the blueprint for the implementation. We want to, we want the design that we create, we want it to be clear enough that we give it to the next person and they can they can base an implementation based on that. And again, here the, the level of detail matters where the people that does the design is the same as the person that does the implementation, then they choose from the higher level. But we also see occasions where uh, Design is made in one country and the implementation in another country. 
then it's better to be a detail of the new design. Because there's no technician in the stand. So uh, it's surprising how much misunderstanding there can be in the But uh, okay, so we knew a bit more. But uh, the real question that we wanted to answer was, of course, does the use of UML and modeling, does it have any real benefits for a project as a whole? And uh, initially, we tried it with experiments and students. It was very difficult to come up with a good experiment. So we did a survey. And so in, in empirical studies, you have different type of studies, uh, experiments and case studies, and um, surveys. Basically, in the survey, you ask after an opinion, rather than that you have an actual observation, a sort of physical measurement. So that the strength of the evidence of a survey is considered a bit weaker than an actual measurement. But still, if you have enough experts that say this is an effect, it's not something to be ignored, right? That you still have at least an indication that this might, might, be, might be the truth. Okay, so this is the result of a, of a survey where we asked, yeah, was the use of UML improved the quality of the software? And we have nice rainbow colors for different types of responses. The blue color denotes that there's, there's a reduction, uh, or the sort of light blue, and the dark blue is an improvement. It's a bit of a your choice of colors. Don't repeat it. And then we asked us the use of your well improve. Yeah, we checked for different types of quality. So we checked for covering the requirements, correctness of the system, modularity, testability, or understandability. You can see that the biggest, uh, the most responses came for understandability. So this supports the belief that we have that it's for managing the complexity. Right? So we have many components and classes that connect together, but once we have a picture, a graphical representation of it, then we better understand what the design is. The second highest benefit was for uh, modularity. So this suggests that there's not only an uh, effect on the system towards the developers, but the understanding leads to a better design. And better modularity is better information hiding and a lower coupling between modules. And a higher modularity is very important for a good maintainability of the software. So if it's the case that the use of a design, a UML design, it affects a reflection on the developers, which will help them make a better modularity, then it's a very valuable positive effect. So, uh, so we were pretty pleased uh, with, with, uh, with these uh, results. Uh, for testability, we have uh, neutral and uh, somewhat improves. I think it can be explained by, by better testability. Testing is the activity that is mostly based on the source code, not so much on the design. So I can also explain, understand there's not a very, uh, very strong effect. Uh, but uh, yellow is considered neutral. So if you sum up the green and the dark blue, and most of these are indicated uh, positive or a very positive effect. The question remains though, but when I can do a little bit of more. So let's look at a different type of study. Um, this is an experiment. And um, for an experiment you start with a hypothesis. You assume some relation between <coughs> Treatments and outcome. Something that you can control and something that you can <coughs> And We wanted to know does the quality of a UML model more matter? Because we found out in this study that there's lots of loose modeling happening. Yeah? There's many, many projects that do loose modeling. It means the, the model was not complete, and sometimes not consistent. Yeah, question? Uh, by, by looking at the uh, by the word losing that yellow, what, what, does it, what does it mean? And what does very strict mean? Is the, yeah, uh, I think what, what does the very strict mean? Thank you. I can answer it's a clarification question. So 
So very strict means they, they model very precisely according to the UML standard. So that means they follow the semantics very precisely and the semantics very precisely. Loose means they're, they're, uh, they use classes, but they use lines. And maybe they're not very precise in indicating uh, whether it's public or private, or um, when there's associations. Maybe they have a role, maybe they're not precise about multiplicity. Yeah. So this is typically done using a case tool. And here it can already be a drawing tool, maybe even PowerPoint. So, um, so the question is, uh, so we, when we did a field study, we found there's lots of UML used in practice that is not what you would expect from the textbook. It's not so precise, it's not complete. Is it a problem? Maybe there's not a problem. I mean, people working in industry here typically have a practical experience, which is also a source of knowledge. So what do we do? Um, we designed a series of questions where we showed fragments of UML and we asked the participants to tell us what it means by showing them fragments of source code that implement this model, this is a part of the design. And they have to answer it from the perspective of the developer. So we have 15 questions uh, with four options and one special option that says something in this design is wrong, I cannot answer it because there's it's poor quality, in the sense. We also have background questions which, which ask after uh, you have a lot of experience with UML, you have a lot of experience in programming, much of the highest education. So, so this is a small test question. I will ask you for a raise of hands. There will be two options, or actually four options. Five. So you have to raise your hand at least once. Yeah? Otherwise, you can't win. I don't have a prize. So, maybe, maybe it's too small for you to see it. Here's a class diagram with some methods. And here's a sequence diagram with the same classes, customer, ATM, and account. So it's a banking system. And then there's a sequence diagram that shows an exchange of message. Suppose you are the developer in this banking project. It is your task to implement the class ATM. Please indicate how you implement this class, give them two diagrams, and here's uh, some examples. And specifically, you have to choose the implementation of the method get card inserted, which is to also illustrate here. How many of you can actually read the sequence diagram? It's a bit small, is it? Okay. Now we're going to have a raise of hands. <coughs> How many of you believe that the answer A is correct? <laughs> no one? <coughs> Anyone for answer B? Still no one? <laughs> answer C? Ah, you're not playing. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, have to raise your hands at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so we did this as part of a course, so the students had to give out. <laughs> students had to give out. Um, it's actually interesting because there is some contradicting information, I think. Uh, I don't know exactly where it is. So the method appears, the method appears here, the sequence diagram. Um, and it does a call to open on a class account. But if you look at the class diagram, the class account doesn't have an open method. And then if you look at the implementation here, there's an open. Uh, but here there's a lock. So the second has, has the lock. So the answers are constructed such that if you believe, if you look, if you look at this diagram, you choose this solution. If you look, look at this diagram, you think that is the solution. The other two are just false. It's interesting because there's a contradiction in the design. So you can also answer there's something wrong. Now it's interesting to see what happens. 
So this has the sequence leading, diagrams leading, cross diagrams leading, cross diagrams leading. It's great. Well, so these are the answers. Um, I think we had around 120 students. So it's not percentages, it's students here. So um, 70 out of 120 say that A is that which means they have proved mostly at the sequence diagram, not at the class diagram. And there's a few that look at D, which is the class diagram, okay, so they've looked at the number. You can also see there's a number that says something else. Uh, and then there's around 30 that say something is wrong. And that by itself is interesting, because we constructed a design that, was, that had a fault. The, the sequence diagram and the class diagram were not consistent with each other. Yet the majority of the students chooses to use an implementation. They just do something. They, 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 don't, they, don't, precisely, they don't precisely read the design. So, there's some interesting lessons to be learned from that. One of them is that you need to check. When you make a design, you need to check that the implementation follows the design. Right? This is actually one of the things that, that, that is not done enough, I would say. Because just creating a design by itself is not enough. It's the starting point for further development. And if you don't monitor it, follow up, that the implementation follows the design, then it might not be so much used in. Uh, yeah? Because programmers are very. Uh, that's called the creative people. Yeah? They think they know how to do this. Yeah? Yeah? And the fact that the designer has agreed with other people that it should be done in a different way, uh, they weren't smart enough to do this. Uh, yeah? So I'd say it's an interesting balance between the designer and the programmer there. Yeah? So 64% they don't see the defect that you see in the we also had a control question. So we had a, co a question where the class diagram and the sequence diagram were consistent. There was no error, but there was only one correct answer. And it's also inter interesting to see what happens. Clearly they choose the answer, but there's still a few that choose other options. So even if the UML is correct, you still get people that choose the wrong, choose the wrong implementation. So that to me, that just means that, that programming is, is human work, right? Where, where humans work, that humans make mistakes. And if you want to produce high quality software, you should, you should be accepting this. I mean, some managers may think that it's a bad thing to make a mistake, but I know no human that never makes a mistake. Right? So you should. This is actually what Agile is very good in because it creates an open atmosphere where people can talk about what goes wrong and how you can improve. So it's very good to be open about mistakes because that's where you can improve. Everyone will make a mistake and that's fine. As long as it's okay to discuss it, it's okay to, to discuss how to improve it. Okay, uh, moving on a bit about uh, Guidelines for experiments. So one of the, uh, the guidelines for experiments and the holds for medical and, and also for software engineering is that the subjects, the people that participate, they should not know what is the goal or the treatment in the experiment. Because if they know this, it might affect their behavior. Yeah. Typically you get this if you, in, in medical science there's the placebo effect. You give people a pill but there's nothing in it. But they still feel they get better because they get a pill, which they think is a treatment. So that you want to avoid. So if you do an experiment, you're not telling people, you're, you're, ideally you don't tell them that you're doing an experiment, but that might not always work. Um, so you don't tell which group, if they're a control group or treatment group, you don't, you don't tell them what's the goal. Um, and that, so that's one side of the blind uh, part, is that the subjects should have known and then in the analysis, it should actually be analyzed by a person that also doesn't know the treatment or doesn't know which is the control group or the treatment group. Because otherwise you can be biased, you can maybe do an extra 
modification on the data, or maybe leave out a few outliers, such that you get the positive results that you hope for. This, this, actually, this actually a bit of a problem in, in science is that positive results get published much more than negative results. If you do a study and nothing interesting comes out, and there's no paper or conference that don't publish it, but there are, but it's not so easy. So there's a bit of bias going on there. So uh, there's a bit of uh, ethical component in doing experiments as well. So first of all, if you do, uh, if you use students, it must not affect the grading in a fair manner. It must not compromise the privacy of the students. Uh, and, and it's also desirable that there is an element of learning, so that the students get the benefit from participating. And um, of course, there, there can be questions about where is about generalizability. Use students as subjects, you don't know if it will apply to software engineers in the industry. I think if you take uh, the mature master students, uh, if they have a lot of programming projects, uh, they're fairly typical. And you can also study office programmers, right? At least if you can say that. I, I've used my study with uh, students. You can assume it might be uh, realistic for office programmers. So, uh, on the note of empirical studies, empirical studies, they study things that exist, right? That's one side of science, the other side of science is doing the actual invention. Once you've, stopped, you've done some empirical studies, you go to your other desk, and you're like, oh, now I can find a solution for this. Now I will improve this testing method, or this modeling method, or this process, so that it solves the problem that I found. And those are the two sides that you can switch between. So I have a slide of study advice. You know, it's not really a beautiful thing. It's a bit of advice. Be creative. I think we all have this in us. Come up with a nice idea. Um, also be critical. Do not believe everything. Um, it's good to know which studies have been done and which evidence there is. Maybe it's good to challenge things. What is the best programming language? There's not so much evidence for that. Or why? Graphical programming languages are better than textual ones. So, uh, so there are lots of things that you can challenge. Uh, be prepared. So I showed you an experiment and a survey. And the survey, actually, there was actually three surveys, right? Because First, we thought there was a good question, and we got answers, and we didn't really hope for what we <laughs> uh, get what we hoped for. Then we did another survey, and we got a bit better understanding, but still not the final answer. So, it is good to, to work in a field and, and try to study and, and first try something out. That is actually another, another advice on the slide. If you do an empirical study, to always run a trial. Do a test of your study before you do the actual study. So, especially in the case with 120 students, we get, a, we get an assignment in the class. If we did something mistake in the, in the materials or in the, in the assignment, you cannot do it again next week. And especially if you do it with industry, you cannot repeat it. So, it's always good to do a small trial study. You get, you get a, few study, a few students, a few of your classmates, ask them to help out. Very important. Uh, and then there's also be bold. Be uh, brave and courageous and think of a big question. Say, uh, I have a colleague that says, uh, shoot for the stars, and sometimes you just might hit one. Software engineering is a young discipline, and many questions are still unanswered. So there's really many, many questions. For this. Okay, so there's a few studies in the making that I'm working on myself at the moment. Uh, one, of this, one of them is uh, about the whiteboard, put like this. We actually uh, managed to, uh, to purchase a smart board, so it's touch sensitive. And we're trying to see if we can use it as a design environment. So basically it's a huge tablet, like a telephone. 
but then you can use it for, for drawing. You can make it a drawing path diagrams, but also, also drawing sketching like I did on this whiteboard. And we want to find out if it works better as a design environment. And first we will work with students and later with professionals. And what other, what other um, study that we actually have so done the first phase is whether examples help in creating designs. So we gave students an assignment and we also gave them a repository which has lots of UML goals in it. You can search it for patterns or for domains. And um, there was a positive effect clearly in this case. So, I mean, that's interesting from a teaching perspective. We, we explain how to do a design and we explain the rules of uh, good design and the rules of object-oriented design. But in addition to that, it's good to show many examples because students also understand why they don't really examples. And uh, the third project is also ongoing. We're building a, a, a web editor for UML. So rather than it runs on your laptop, it runs in the browser. And in this way, we want to be able to uh, give feedback to students that work in an online assignment. So we give them an assignment and they have to work it online. But it, so the teacher is not at the desk, but still we want to give some type of feedback. So we see them create a class, we see them create an association, or I should say the system sees them naked. And then at some point they're stuck. And then we want the system to try to be able to answer the question. So that the system must understand what they find difficult. And here we give automated feedback. Maybe automated grading. It's also interesting for you, it's interesting for me because it saves us teachers a lot of work if you can have the computer to grade all your assignments. So, uh, and those are open, those are, those are open, uh, open questions. Uh, So I move a bit into the, uh, into the summary of my talk for today. Uh, so I hope I've conveyed that uh, I think it is fun to do empirical studies with software engineering. I think it's nice because you get to work with, with subjects and you see them use your technology. Um, I, I hope I have given you an understanding of what empirical studies are. Um, they are not difficult to do. I'm also not saying they're easy, but the good thing is that you can practice, and from the practice you can come up with a great book design. <coughs> and um, the studies they lead to great practical insights, and also to good research questions. So there's, so there's researchers around the world and different universities that exchange their findings at various conferences on software engineering. I know that your university organizes a conference. Uh, there exist special conferences for empirical studies. So, uh, so if you've done a nice study, you can, you can write up a paper and present it there. So I have some references. It's not interesting to read those up. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for attending the lecture. And I'm very happy to answer any questions.
Okay, okay. It's a very difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> I can, I can tell you that one of the reasons why, why we started working towards a whiteboard environment is because it doesn't impose the rigor that UML as a notation has. And UML itself is geometric shapes and you can connect lines, basically box and lines. But if you, you can actually find uh, online, if you're interested, you should send an email and I'll answer it. You can find online some videos that have been taken of software people that are working in front of the whiteboard. They were given an assignment, and you see how they start sketching and how they start moving. And it seems that in the initial phase of design, people want to have this liberty of, of, of just sketching, of being free and associating ideas. And you see that over time, they start structuring the whiteboard. Okay, we use this part for the whiteboard for the design, and this part of the whiteboard for the requirements, and maybe this for the behavior, or for the special cases. So at the beginning it is very vague and informal and, and, and over time it becomes more rigorous and more structured. So and I think this is the insight that I believe is the case that if you want to support design in a good way you need to support both. And you need to support the initial brainstorming in an informal textual way and then later support the transition into a more rigorous formalized idea, which is also maintainable. So that for the brainstorming and the creative part, you need to be flexible and liberal and allow all things. And for the maintenance, you need to be strict and rigorous. So the tools need to support the transition between those. More questions? that you're all working on a project? Yeah? Yes. Okay, I want to ask, uh, how to validate the design from a critical approach? How to validate, how to validate the design help from a critical approach? The design of a student is always great. You need to create the design of your experiment. So, uh, is that what you mean? How to validate. It's a good design. Yeah. Uh, the best way is to uh, get some experts uh, to uh, review it. Uh, <laughs> show it to an expert and ask him to review it. So that's the best thing. So when I, was, when I was at university, no one told me about the German studies. So I learned by reading the books and by trying it out. And I've made a lot of mistakes in the studies that I've done. But I learned about the time again. So if you want to do it as a as a thesis project, I would advise you to at least do it in pairs, maybe, maybe if you want to get your supervisor to review the design before you work this way. And uh, in general approach someone that is, has expertise, maybe maybe there's people in uh, physics or chemistry or, uh, or biology that have that experience in design. See if you can mobilize their, their expertise. More questions, please. Uh, a bit of economic trade-off, how far you are with the project. 
I'll tell you, it's the people. Yeah? So the impact of people, their skills, and the quality of their collaboration in the team is the single most important factor in your product, in your project. Always. Programming languages not so important, tools not so important, process not so important. People. People, people, So people are the most important quality factor in your project. Of course, you want them to be skilled and you want them to be knowledgeable about technology and design. Um, and I, I'm convinced, actually, that it is important to have good training, uh, like, you, like you have from your university. Um, what is important skills? Analytical skills is important to understand what is the essence of the problem, uh, to understand which is the most important part of the problem. Uh, loads of algorithms is important. Uh, but don't underestimate the, the soft skills either. It's skills about communication, being able to understand the problem as it is being explained, being able to explain the, the limitations of the solution, being able to explain the trade-offs that you need to make between performance and security. So technical skills is one pillar of a good software engineer. Social soft skills is the other pillar of being a good uh, software engineer. People are very, very, very important. You guys. I think I will hand back from to you. Other question? Last question? Maybe you want to ask about the topic of your topic. Master thesis or final project? Maybe. No? Okay, that's one. Thank you. Uh, one, thing, uh, one thing I haven't been clear, what may America research difference from other regions? The question is what, what makes empirical research different from other research? Uh, if you ask that, it's actually a good sign, because it, in a way it should be similar to other research. And I've tried to explain it, the theory of research is similar in the sense that it is based on observations. But there used to be, so I was trained at the department, the informatica department, that grew out of mathematics. And there's, there's been a long history of computer science without empirical studies. So they, they invented specification languages. I don't know if you've touched on that. But Normal languages for specification or set or VDN or CSP. It's mathematically based languages for specification. And they were good because there was a good professor that invented them. But there was no evidence that the actual use led to improvements. So the, the notion of empirical studies seems very obvious, but it hasn't been for the first 30 years in software engineering. So it is a recent trend of the past 10, 15 years that, that, that researchers in software engineering start to do this. So, it looks obvious now. Was it always obvious? Uh, I think the, the question is now to come from the um, top. Is it really going to do the, the Software engineering research, your software engineering research, there's some uh, thought that uh, if you don't program, you, you're not into the, the informatics or software engineering. So it's more like a social uh, study. So uh, yeah, in response to it, I would say that. Uh, Software engineering is a very specific discipline. If you look at computer science as a whole, it gets split up in, in different partitions in different universities. Sometimes with electrical engineering, sometimes with mathematics, sometimes with sociology, and you have IT in organizations that apply IT. I think it is I think interesting that this discipline has so many interfaces, has so many connection points to so many other. It's not so much the case for chemistry that you have all these 
not so much for physics. You can have a software engineering is, but is, I think, unique in the sense that it has mathematical parts, that it has social social parts, and cognitive parts, organizational parts. So, uh, and on the note of whether it's 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 software engineering. All of them. So I've, I've argued for the importance of people in software development. The tools and the processes that the researchers invent, I think they are tools in the hands of people. So unless we validate that those tools are actually an improvement, we know nothing. Right? So from that perspective, I think it is very important that we not only build the tools, but that we verify that the tools are actually an improvement. So you will you will grow into pivotal central roles that that pay that are much more first of all they're better paid, but they're also you have the most influence in a project. So programming skills are important, but design skills are at least as important. So you are going to the designer. So the trend, the current trend is not the programming but now we have the uh, first generator in Skype, but the basic thing is whatever you want to do. Design, look for better design. Okay, I think that's enough. No more question. Okay, I'll pass for Professor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.